Hello, and welcome to 20 Lore Pro, the competitive resource for Lorcana players who enjoy deck building, competing, and talking all things Lorcana. You can find out more at our Discord community, 20lore.pro slash Discord. Link in the description. In today's video, we're joined by B Decandio7 as he talks about his Order 66 Amber Steel deck list, which he took and won at the PAX 2K Easter Special Tournament. We want to thank B Decandio7 for interviewing and talking about his Order 66 deck list. If you'd like to find more deck lists like in today's video, head on over to our 20lore.pro Discord. If you'd like to support the 20 Lore Pro team and all that we do from behind the scenes, head on over to our 20 Lore Pro Patreon. Thank you all so much for watching today's video, and we hope you enjoy. Hello and welcome to 20 Lore Pro. Today I am here with B Decandio 7 off of his latest victory with the PAX Easter Special 2K tournament. Uh, hello B Decandio 7, how are you doing today? Good, good. Uh, Brennan's good, Decandio's good. We have your Order 66 deck list up <laughs> on the screen for everyone to see. I just want to say I'm a big fan of the name Order 66. Did that come, I'm guessing, from a play on Star Wars? Yeah, it, it was more just of a joke. There was just a point before the event where I wanted to add some cards and not figure out what, what I was going to cut. And then I was like, well, I'm already adding more cards than I should. So I'll just add a couple more and then make it a joke. Uh, no, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, it seemed like it really worked out for you. It uh, it did well enough, you know, it, it, it won where it gave me some chances to, to play well and, and to, to to maneuver in tough situations and, and, you know, was kind to me when I want, needed it to be. So that's all you can really ask for. That's true. And some some people may not know this, uh, the pack, they host tournaments from time to time. And uh, could you talk a little bit about the pack and their tournament sets and then the Easter special Lorcana tournament that you were part of this past weekend? Sure. Uh, I'm not I'm not sure exactly what the pack is in quotes. I don't know who it may consist of or if that's just the name of it. I know it's uh, Tia Beasley's uh, event and she's been doing a bunch of uh, online pixel board events uh, the past, you know, I think good, good bit, maybe two months now, three months now. I'm not I'm not 100 percent certain. The uh, one in March, uh, the the exactly a month ago, March 2nd was the first one I played in and it's been two weeks since then. There was another one, and then uh, this past weekend, which happened to be on Easter. And I remember being the one at the end of the last one, kind of pushing for it. She wasn't sure if she was going to do an Easter one. I'm like, yeah, just do it. And like, I don't know, have like a, you know, it'd be Mad Hatter themed. And that's why you saw on the page, it had like a, one of the characters from, from Alice in Wonderland on the front there. And I was like, yeah, it'd be great. But uh, yeah, it worked out well, uh, suggesting it, I guess. But no, it, it was a lot of fun. Um, I, I enjoyed, uh, you know, playing Lorcana. I, I always do enjoy competing. Yeah. Yeah, this season has been, as many have said on Twitter and on Discord, a very volatile time, which is kind of exciting because we're seeing a lot of decks where maybe in set one and two, they were more established. We kind of knew what the top decks are. And for the most part, we know one of the top decks being Ruby, Ruby Amethyst. But this time we're seeing a lot of flex decks kind of jump into tier one and really pushing ahead. Uh, I believe a couple weeks back, you even played a Ruby uh, Amber Mufasa list at one of the pack tournaments. But now you're here playing a Amber Steel Song deck. Where have you found success with some of these lists? And what's kind of your favorite color pairing so far for this season? Uh, I mean, it's got to be my favorite one, you know, to play and, and, and to enjoy is probably the, the Ruby Amber uh, Mufasa deck. It just, you know, I'm I like playing a lot of decks, with a lot of, you know, utility. Uh, characters or in other games like creatures and a bunch of things that do things when they come into play and uh, it kind of are more resilient to removal and kind of let you play multiple kind of game plans with being the aggressor or the control game and and the the amber amber ruby move off stack plays into that but it is not quite as explosive as as the the amber steel deck and it doesn't have the as punishing of draws as, as this deck does this can really contain every aspect of the game pretty much it plays much better on on the draw which is is important but not like definingly important and kind of moving on to you know the new format that we were playing it was the the i, I like to call it two game set 
best of two two game set because it's not really a best of that it's, it's kind of you're playing two games and, and that's what it is but i think this is more well suited to that that format so that's kind of what i went with this for uh, for this event as opposed to the last couple i i can agree with what you're saying a lot of steel cards really a lot of utility and especially the great singers that are in amber they can utilize those steel cards very effectively uh, makes for a strong strategy but that was interesting to hear you say that in the in the two game format you think that the steel amber list at least has a better advantage how has the how has the play format for you been with these two game sets have you enjoyed playing with it or have you seen some constraints with it um i mean personally i'm not the biggest fan um the more games i get to play to have you know a kind of win i i guess is 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 better for me i i feel at least it's more it's more fun for me to play more games against someone and the, the biggest decisive part of it for me is whenever i sit down for a match i want there to be a winner and this past weekend the record that i made you know the top 16 with was you know essentially four two o's and then five draws five one ones and that just doesn't feel good. No one feels like they've won. No one feels like anything happened during that time frame, and that just really irked me. And it, it that wasn't a great experience. And and that's what my biggest kind of complaint is that not being able to leave a table it felt like you know, I accomplished anything. I kind of just kind of sat there and we didn't do much for the whole time. It almost it really almost feels like a loss when you, when you draw with someone. And 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 that's been my experience, and and I have a lot of others as well. Uh, I've had that uh, same feelings I have. So. Not the biggest fan, but I, I am accepting it for, for what it is for now. I'm glad that they're trying things. They, they've tried this. They're trying this format. Um, and who knows? Maybe, uh, you know, if I get used to it, it'll, it'll be different. And, it, you know, my perspective may change from playing it more than, you know, one or two times. Uh, but maybe they'll change their minds as well. You know, this was a good experiment. But, you know, really, you guys, you guys are, you know, we'll want to try something else. It may not be best of three. Maybe something else. Who knows? It was the first, uh, first test run. And, uh, yeah, that's just how I felt. Yeah, it really is interesting to see a new game like Lorcana kind of testing the waters to see where they want to be with tournament play, especially with the new comprehensive rules coming onto the stage for the first time. And we saw games kind of like Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh! and Magic. If you look back into their early, earlier days, some of them having different rule sets, some of them maybe playing a little bit differently. And at least for Lorcana, this will be interesting to see where the player base wants to go with it and how Ravensburger responds to it. Um, so we'll see how that goes in the future. I'm excited to see kind of how tournament play, especially with the championships comes along. Yep. Still in the early stages to learn to, to learn from our perspective and also learn from their perspective as to how they want things to go. So we'll definitely uh, have a lot of time, not even a year into the game yet. Hmm. <laughs> well, how did it feel to win the PAX 2K Easter Special Lorcana Tournament. That must have felt pretty good. Yeah, I mean, winning an event always feels uh, good for me for, for other reasons as well, because of my viewpoint of the best of two and the reasoning for it, you know, the, the play having such a big advantage in the best of three. Well, I was actually on the draw every single round of, of this top 16, because I was in 16th place and it was based off seeding, but also the previous one I had won about four weeks ago. I was on the draw every round except for the finals because it was random at that point, but I lost all the die rolls. So I I was pretty happy to kind of maybe, you know, prove a little bit of a point in addition to winning. So so that was a big uh that was a big win for me as well. Uh, more so than, you know, winning uh, in a lot of ways actually. That's great. And and even able to like say that you did win, but in addition to that, you kinda had a goal, a secondary goal in mind, and you met it. And you get to kind of show what your intentions are with it. We're still, as we said early on in the game, and I think that a lot of the decisions that have been made have been based off of data, which, I mean, there's a lot of data on Pixel 1 especially, but it also is not from a developed player base to where I'd really trust the results as much as a game that maybe in Magic you would take the same kind of data from the actual Pro Tour itself or, you know, the highest level of competition versus I, uh, ladder rankings isn't always the same skill base. It's, it could be matchups and other things. And so it's hard to tell. No, you're, you're exactly right. And I think we're going to get some good data o over the next year as we see these Orkana championships, you know, the first one being in May on Memorial weekend, 
over in Atlanta, Georgia. Really excited to see. I, I think that thing sold out within the first two minutes. I think uh, it was a minute and a half, not even. I, I mean, we're going to see some player data from Competitive Bubble very soon. Yeah, it should be interesting. I didn't uh, get my own ticket, so I did not, not going to be there uh, as of now. But who knows? Maybe, uh, maybe they'll open up some more slots and I, I managed to get one. That's kind of my desire, too, is that they will open up some more slots or maybe even say they'll have the pre-registered tickets for 500 and maybe they'll have more in person. Well, as we're taking a look at Order 66, uh, could you walk us through a broad overview of the deck and some of the cards you chose and maybe some of the MVPs of the list? Yeah. Sure. So this is just an evolution from almost the the same deck we've seen since the early days of set one. Uh, really, Amber Steel. I mean, really, it's Ariel uh, and Home the World. Those are the two cards that really pair well together. And you know, the cards that are that are singers, the the one cost Cinderella, uh, Ariel. Those two cards together really are what lean into me kind of saying that you can win going second with, especially with a deck like this. You have a lot of catch up mechanics and the fact that they are. You know, from borrowing a term from magic kind of ritual effects, you get pay one uh, ink for your Cinderella, but then you can use it to sing something cost three. So you kind of get that you know extra ink effect um, from the singers that have singer value over the the cost of them. So that that's a big part of what's going on here, helping you kind of get ahead and stay ahead is pressing forward as fast as you can with all your cards and having them refill your hand and disrupt along the way is 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 really what the sex all about. We have the most efficient kind of shift lines with uh the queen one and five being able to shift a whole new world on turn two even um queen five is a little bit resilient i'm not familiar with all the names commanding presence so not the most resilient dies to most uh things but it definitely in combat threatens a lot of damage coming out of nowhere as well helping deal with locations kind of why it's there over the stitch line but uh the you know, one cost in the rock star those are kind of swapped out from the previous version i played to, to these because of that and the robin hood Having six willpower there is just huge. Uh, dodging a pretty heavily played card along came Zeus is, is what makes it so good for right now. Just having the ability to survive that kind of thing and not kind of get tempoed out by someone else singing into yours, singing Zeus on your Robin Hood and then you know, playing their other threat as well. So you're really trying to take a front foot to basically every matchup, but you also have this kind of weird role that since all your cards are also just like these giant floodborns that have shift, Late in the game, your cards that you could play out early are also just castable for their their ink cost, you know, at the top there. So being able to put pressure early with all these things, refill your hand and get ahead using cards like Lantern to really even, you know, go first when you're going second or, you know, go first and make them go third, essentially, uh, is really what makes this deck tick. Uh, staying ahead and having just a bit of removal with all the songs, you know, there's 12 pieces of removal through songs, the... Storm Age on, Strength Raging Fire, Zeus's, and, and Grab Your Sword all, all you know, line up pretty well across the board against almost any character you can play. Um, and yeah, you, you just want to pedal to the metal with this deck and, and, and usually just get ahead, stay ahead, or uh, you know, punish someone for, for keeping a slow hand as well. Yeah, and this deck, I, I think they gained in Into the Inklands a really great shift target, like you were saying, in Robin Hood. Just the fact that it has that six, t six toughness, it can survive, and then along came Zeus, and it just has the ability to shift so early on for three. Really, having that five singer ability in this deck seems mm -hmm. very powerful. Yep, definitely having five costs, letting you do grab your sword and hold a world early is is a thing. And Robin specifically with that ability to gain lore, much like we saw Aladdin in set one, whenever it. Uh, you know, challenges, banishes a character. Kind of lets you play defense while playing offense a lot of ways too. To, if you need to get back into a game, you're not too far behind just by challenging with your big character a bunch over and over. You still are gaining the lore so that once you turn the corner, they have nothing left in play. So it's a big game and it, it definitely was one of the key cards I'd say to making this deck, I would say from close to tier one, the previous format, uh, up to, I think, you know, what you really need to understand is a deck that you're going to play against I would imagine some variation of Amber Steel uh, in a tournament. And my preference is the Lanterns version, but people have their own preferences. But Robin Hood is, 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 a, is one that's going to stick around for a bit. And really the only other Inklands cards, I guess Along Came Zeus is a premier removal spell, which is 
something we've been looking for for Steel, kind of unconditional ways to deal with medium to big characters. But Bare Necessity is just really throwing a wrench into a lot of uh, a lot of decks game plans, whether it be taking Be Prepared out of Sapphire Ruby or Ruby Amethyst, or just early game with Fishbone Quill against the Ruby Sapphire and the uh, Blue Steel decks. So definitely lets you just, you know, sculpt the game plan just by seeing their hand and yeah, I mean, that only benefits someone who who kind of knows how to maneuver around certain cards and certain matchups there by taking a key piece and leaving them with, you know, playing right into what you want them to play into or disrupting them enough to where you're going to get ahead where they can't catch up. That was a really good key distinction that you made about Bear Necessities not only being great against the Be Prepared decks, but also the Fishbone Quill decks. Because even early on, you can take their Fishbone Quills and you tilt them off of their ramp strategy but even late game you're able to take those lucky dimes where sometimes they'd win Mm -hmm. with those in one or two turns if the lucky dime survives yeah no absolutely Uh, i mean it being inkable as well is just really icing on the cake there it probably would see some play even if it wasn't but uh not as much but it being an inkable card where you know some matchups there i've I've kept it sometimes in a matchup say against the a Ruby uh, Amber and Mufasa decks where I know it has almost no targets just to be ink on turn one just so I have at least something I don't want my deck to draw later it's just it's just there to get rid of and no it's it's a really powerful card I'm glad it exists in the game honestly it and Ursula both uh just having some way to interact with your opponent's hand is uh and punishing certain types of cards you know encouraging people to play with a bunch of characters so they don't get hit with those types of effects that are powerful it's it's a it's a cool card and I'm, I'm glad we have it here I'm sure there'll be other variations of of a discard effect as we move, you know, further and further with more more chapters into Lorcana, but for right now, uh, we're good with what we got, and uh, this is a good addition to the deck. Yeah, I agree. This bare necessities for me in Amber Steel Song really helps, like you were saying with Robin Hood, push it over the edge. It makes it a whole new tier of deck that makes it very viable in competitive play. With this strategy, you have a lot of removal. You have an ability to refill your hand and to sing a lot of strong cards early on. What is this strategy for this deck kind of best against, or what is it looking to beat that are the main competitors to it? Yeah. So the, the worst matchup you're going to face is probably the, the Ruby Sapphire ramp deck with, you know, as you said, lucky dime. They also have Medusa. They have Tremaines. They have Maui's. They have Gaston's, Tomatoes, all that stuff. Be prepared, of course. That deck just doesn't really have any of the vulnerabilities to the removal spells you're playing. It almost ignores them, and it's really hard to get ahead and always stop all of their ramps. Sometimes you can, and it works out. But more often than not, they're even going to be able to you know power through even bare necessities on Fishbone Quill um, pretty well and kind of get to the the end game there. So that's something that you don't want to see, but. Aside from that kind of matchup there, this deck has game against, I would say, everything else you can you can, you can can play against there. A lot of the decks try to go under it, but it's really hard to go under, uh, you know, a uh, shifted Robin Hood saying, grab your sword on turn three. So that that is pretty hard to come back from, even if you're trying to be aggressive against it. And uh, a lot of the card advantage options that people use in this game are either a whole new world, which this deck can, with the little characters that you shift onto... Uh, deploy, you know, a bunch of them all at once that all have to be answered. You get more cheap threats that can immediately challenge or sing uh, off the shift the following turn or just a, you know, bevy of options to either disrupt with more removal and, or just giant threats later in the game. So the only deck you don't really play against is Ruby Sapphire and, you know, if you'd asked me earlier this week, or I should say last week the beginning of last week, if I was going to play this deck, I would have said probably not because there was a lot of Ruby Sapphire, but then people kind of ticked up to maybe, you know, thinking that uh, Amber Steel is, is kind of out of the metagame for a bit because they don't want to play against Ruby, Ruby Sapphire. So people tried to beat up on Ruby Sapphire and other decks and they kind of try to fight each other. And then I was like, well, it's not as bad as you might think. And it's still, it's still, someone has to play that deck, you know, for me to feel that bad about the matchup. So I didn't really play against it too often. I played against it, I think, once or twice in the Swiss of nine rounds and that was it. But I won one, uh, I know I won one of the matches 2 0. So that was an uh, interesting uh, thing to have happen there, even though it's traditionally not a favorable matchup. But still can win you have game against everyone so wow that's great uh, like you were saying even able to beat your weakest matchup is kind of where you want to be at and how did you find the win against your matchup against ruby sapphire yeah sometimes it's you know this deck can get ahead pretty quickly and when i think that happened in the game i'm trying to recall specifically 
you know, I kind of was ahead a bit early and I played a bare necessities. I think they just didn't have anything really much going on. I took a random item or maybe a random, I don't think this would be paired, but then I just kept playing more things out and my deck's much more efficient at deploying threats than they have answers. And they just didn't drop be prepared and got to 20. So it was, uh, I mean, it, it happens. Uh, you, be prepared is a card to always be mindful of, but sometimes you just realize that I played in a way where I literally just put everything on the table because I didn't want to lose to any other card in their deck except for be prepared. If they had it, I lost. That's fine. But I don't want them to be able to survive with a Tremaine or a Medusa or a Maui, so I just dumped everything on the table and said, don't have it. And they didn't. And that's just sometimes how you need to win games. So That's a really good point, Peter Candio, that even if you're facing the worst matchup, sometimes they either have it or they don't, and sometimes they just don't, and you get the win. Oh, more often than not, they won't. Just so you guys know, I know it might feel like uh, they always draw it, or they always have it, they always top deck it. They don't, and that's just uh, I like to call it the the red light dilemma, where people think they have more red lights than green lights, but they don't. So it's just you know push forward and hope it works out, and sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, and you gotta accept that. But you want to give yourself the chance to win through all the other potentials, except for the one, and yeah, you know, that's just a a good way to play games is to give your opponent the least amount of outs possible. The more I've talked with competitive players, the more I've kind of heard this idea of kind of like the zone where someone's like running really hot and you can have the best deck list, the best strategies you've play tested, and then you hit the tournament and you start running real hot. And every time you hit an opponent, even if it's your weakest matchup, you, you just find the win and other days you're just not there. You can have the best deck, best strategy, and you just don't get it you hit all the worst matchups and then they have it every single time mm -hmm. sometimes that's competitive play yeah d definitely i mean you can have good days bad days and at the end it is a game and you know there's we're not playing chess here so there will be a, you know some random factors that go into each game but we do the best to influence what we can control and that's that's all we can do well, looking at this deck, we've talked already about some of the best kind of lineups you have with your early drop singers like Cinderella and Ariel. What are some of the, of the cards that when you see them in your opening hand that you already want to pitch away? Such as if you maybe have too much ink or you've got too many copies of one card. Too much ink isn't really something I ever consider to be a problem often. Uh, I usually, if I see that, will put back, you know, I will then look at some of the cards in my hand as specifically ink if I want them to be. If they're, you know, cheaper cards, let's say I have like a hand with, I don't know, three, three one cost Cinderella's or maybe a Cinderella, a Queen and a Robin Hood. I might just keep all of them and I know I'm going to ink two of them so I don't draw them in the mid game. Um, but well, no, with this hand, it really does depend. It, it, it That's the thing I think that people, why we're seeing such a disparity uh, in people play with play and draw. They don't treat the cards in their deck differently based off the player draw a lot of times um your cards literally have different text whether you're going first or second and sometimes if i'm going second and i don't know what i'm playing against the cinderella that was in my hand that i kept going second and they play their cinderella is now just ink and i'm just not going to play it out because i don't want the interaction where they have a uh, let the storm rage on just take out my cinderella for free and kind of knock me back a whole ink um you know as far as what i could ink for my hand because that Cinderella is going to be, you know, a copy of the Beast in my hand that I now get to play that I didn't have to ink early because I kept my Cinderella in my hand. So there's, it's all contextual, um, what you keep or don't keep. Um, I think one of the cards I'll, I mean, the cards that I will almost always keep, there's probably three, I would say. It's going to be, uh, or maybe a little more. I'll always keep, you know, if I have one of the shift line, like the bigger shift cards in my hand, I might keep one uh, just to... You know, have a potential to redraw into other things. I'll always keep at least a one-drop Cinderella. I'll always keep an Ariel. I'll always keep a Lantern. Those are the three big ones. But the Queen and the Robin Hood are contextual based off of the rest of the hand too. But those are really what you're looking for to, to start every game is Lantern to get ahead, Ariel to dig for songs and, you know, sing that whole in the world or grab your sword and Cinderella to uh, get the Storm Rage on or Bare Necessities or Strength Raging Fire. It all depends. Looking at your list, you really don't have a lot of uninkable cards, really just between the Grab Your Swords, Let the Storm Rage On, and Lantern, and that's really not that many. So this is a pretty balanced list as far as uh, uninkables go. I, I imagine you haven't had too many problems when you're playing with not having enough ink in your inkwell. 
Yeah, the only card you ever really get, I mean, the only two cards I'd say you really get cluttered with sometimes are Whole New World and Grab Your Sword. Um, but maybe something went wrong in the early game that made that happen. But I'm, I'm pretty conservative with my mulligans. I actually just don't keep the Whole New World unless I'm certain that I both have the shift line ready to go and I'm usually on the play with that, that I want to make sure it happens. Because on the draw, it might not always be good to Whole New World, even, even on turn two, it might not be right to do uh, with, with queen so I, I i usually unless i'm going first i've never kept a whole new world i'm pretty certain but going first i've kept it when i know you know i have the shift line ready to go but yeah i, I usually ship all the uninkables except for except for lantern and sometimes the storm rage on when i have a cinderella but everything else goes now talking about some of these cards uh, especially whole new world maybe not keeping the opening hand and i see that you're playing the big seven drop cinderella stout heart mm -hmm. What would you say are some of the flex cards that you may increase or decrease depending on the different decks that you're seeing in the meta? <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, that's why there's 66 cards in the deck. <laughs> um, because I was uh, playing uh, some games. It was, I think, 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock or something like that on, on Saturday before the event started. And I was like, I don't remember what I wanted to cut. I actually didn't have any copies of Beast in my deck uh, at the time. I just had removed it to kind of eschew the whole Medusa dilemma, but I didn't think that Ruby Amethyst would be as popular as it had been weeks prior, and I was right. So Medusa wasn't as big of a deal as it otherwise would, and you kind of needed it against the Emerald decks to uh, kind of outbalance their discard. So I added back three Sad Beasts. I added a fourth copy of the Queen, uh, one and five, and then I added a third copy of Surfer Stitch because I like Stitch. Um, and that's, I think that's, those are the five cards, the one queen, one, the one queen five, and then the three beasts. And then I was at 65 cards. I'm like, eh, let's just make it funny and have 66. So I put the server in, that's I great. don't know, the flex slots. I, I don't know. I mean, the core of the deck is really in my mind, it's, you know, Cinderella one, Ariel, uh, Robin Hood, Robin Hood, Lantern, and some of the songs that that's really the, the core of the deck, you know, the vendors, the Rapunzel's, the some debate on the Tinkerbells, the Surfers, the Big Cindies even are all, all debatable uh, in some way, shape, or form, depending on how you want to take the deck. There are more aggressive versions of Amber Steel that still play songs that don't have some of those cards. Um, there's some even more controlling versions I've seen that don't play Whole New World. That was kind of a harken back to set one next thought experiment, but I don't I don't agree with that. But no, it, it's really what you want to make it. But there's there's like you said, some cards which are really the core, and it's it's really just really really aerial, and I think Robin Hood now so. I, I was wondering, looking at this list, how often did you see Rapunzel get used to help you draw cards? Oh, it happens a lot. Mm, the, one of the biggest things about uh, keeping, when I'm talking about Cinderella and keeping the Storm Rage on, is that I used, I think, I think Rapunzel was turned on more than anything else by myself. I think I turned it on by shooting my own things more than my opponent actually let me do it. So I'd be in situations where I could kill a 2-2, sure, but I could also just like shoot my Robin Hood for two and then heal it. And then I draw, you know, essentially three cards with this this combo there. So knowing that your cards have different modes other than just what they you think they do normally, which is kill your opponent's things, helps Rapunzel look a lot better when you uh, see it. And also, of course, sometimes your opponents, you know, you're slogging, you're top decking, and they're just like, man, if they ever draw Rapunzel here, I'm just done. And because you guys are putting damage on beasts to make people not draw, and then trading stuff off, and a tink Tinkerbell shoots something else and doesn't quite kill it, and then someone draws Rapunzel and the game ends because that's just three cards and your character's healed back. So it's kind of a huge tempo swing too. That's something that I hadn't thought about was using Let the Storm Rage on to your own Robin Hood and you know it'll survive. Just mm -hmm. to make sure that you draw three. That's, um, that could be game changing. Oh yeah, I've, I've had to turn three aerial Let the Storm Rage on herself several times and just heal it back up. And I'm just like, okay, well, this is what this is doing right now because I need to draw some cards and you know, against like Ruby Sapphire, they don't really damage your characters outside of playing Maui, really. So, or they just kill him with Medusa, and uh, that's not really helping Rapunzel out in any way. So, wow, well, that's great to hear that Rapunzel, who when I first saw the list thought, man, I, I don't know how much work it's getting in. You really, with your 66 cards, adding the beasts, Robin Hood, of course, being a great card, um, really utilizing Rapunzel to get some extra draws to get the win. Well, thank you so much, B to Candy 7 for giving us an overview of Amber Steel Song. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with the audience? Uh, I'm just excited to see what else uh, is in the next set. We saw a couple previews for uh, set four and 
the other aerial I think that's coming out or whatever looks interesting. Don't know how good or bad it'll be. We'll see. But I don't know. It's a cool deck that has a lot of flexibility to it. And, you know, if I spent more time refining to an exact 60, it uh, would have been interesting to see what I ended up taking out uh, because I, I don't know the correct 60. And that's kind of why they're 66. So it's uh, if someone wants to put their mind to it, they certainly can. Well, we look forward to kind of how this deck evolves and to see you play more especially with the pack events and hopefully soon with some of the championships. And we really hope that you do get a ticket and you're able to go to play, <laughs> especially in Atlanta. Yeah, it'd be fun. Not too far from me, so. Well, I will be there as well. So if you end up going, would love to link up. <laughs> I'll let you know. We want to thank Candio 7 again for interviewing with us today over his Order 66 Amber Steel Song decklist. Thank you all so much for watching. We hope that you enjoyed the video.